Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is Trump's Madison Square Garden Rally Was a Racist Insult Festival. Seldom is a presidential election that we see has such a vast difference of the two opposing candidates and certainly such a, 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 a campaign where the final messages could not be further apart. Uh, recently, this Sunday, Trump had his Lindbergh esque, Nazi esque 1939 Ma Madison Square Garden rally, and it was a lineup of deplorable, vulgar speakers to set the stage and tone for Donald Trump. If Trump loses this election, you can look back at this, this particular event where the messages spewed, attributed by an, a, a comedian, a so called comedian that insulted Latinos and specifically Puerto Ricans. Calling Puerto Rico a floating island of garbage is an odd way to attract and woo 300,000 potential Puerto Rican voters in Pennsylvania. Uh, to compound insult with injury, it took two days for the Trump campaign to directly respond. Trump said days later, two days later, that uh, he didn't know the person and he certainly didn't know the lineup. How many times have we heard that from Donald Trump? Uh, further, he said that the rally was an absolute love fest. J.D. Vance, he did his part, said he lied, saying that he never saw the comments, but emphasized that Americans have to get over being so sensitive, that in fact, he was just, um, just over it. Uh, I'm not sure the Latinos and Puerto Ricans may feel the same. I don't know if they feel like they're over it. The Madison Square Garden was the final note and preview of Trump's second term, starting for to set the stage for fear and retribution, a continuation of his racism, xenophobia, scapegoating, and of course, a constant search of the enemy within. And to discuss that, I have my special esteemed guest, Ben Davis, my other special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, Jay, to you first. There are probably 575,000 Puerto Ricans in New York City. There's over 300,000 registered voters that are Puerto Rican in Pennsylvania, 100,000 in North Carolina, and 50 to 60,000 in Arizona. What was Don Donald Trump's team thinking about this? Um, you know, these comments, once just by a comedian alone, I mean, what I found equally disturbing was uh, Stephen Miller. You remember Stephen Miller? He was the uh, political advisor in the first Trump administ administration, um, chief architect of the border issues and taking babies away from their parents. Uh, he said something very Nazi-ish. Uh, back in 39 at that rally, they said, Germany for Germans. Well, Stephen Miller said, American for Americans and Americans only. Uh, how close are they trying to get to uh, replicating a, a, a 1939 Nazi rally in New York City in the same location, Madison Square Garden? Your thoughts? It had all the elements to that. They, they really tried hard to make it look like the photographs we have of the 1939 rally. By the way, there was another rally, an earlier rally in 1934 in Madison Square Garden. So Madison Square Garden is bonded to this whole notion of Nazis in America. In any event, yes, the answer is yes. I think he was trying to make it look like a Nazi rally in the 30s. And remember that uh, Trump you know, used to keep Mein Kampf on his bedstand. And according to the latest uh, discussions, um, he actually read it. And we were all surprised by the fact that he read something. But he read that. And and I haven't read it myself. But I don't know if any of you guys have spent the time and effort and protoplasm to read Mein Kampf. But Mein Kampf, you know, has a roadmap. And if you read Mein Kampf, so they say, uh, it will sound a lot like Trump. Okay, one of the things that um, I, I want to mention is that uh, when Kamala Harris uh, did her uh, convention speech, there was a very good convention, and her debate with Trump, she was ahead. And, um, you know, the polls showed that she was ahead. By the way, you can look at a kind of summary of electoral votes on electoral-vote.com and click on a state. 
And you'll see not only what the votes would be, but you'll see the trend lines on how the votes are doing. And they're likely to change after these remarks about the Puerto Ricans. In any event, so Trump had to get back up on top. And we've talked about that. We've talked about how he, he needed to develop a strategy here in the last few weeks of the election uh, to, um, to overcome the momentum that Kamala set up in the convention and in the debate. <clears throat> and he went back to his play playbook. We, we, we expected he would. We predicted he would. It's a it's a playbook of insult. And if you, you know, just chart out all the things that he's done, all the re ridiculous re remarks that he's made, including about the Nazis and sending people to jail and deporting millions, millions of people. Um, you know, that's what he's been doing. Outrageous statements, outrageous insults, really, you know, uh, schoolyard insults. And he's been doing it more and more. If you look at the trend line of him doing insults, you see more and more. Okay, I think he went over the side in this one. There's no question that he he approved what the comedian was going to say. He approved what they were all going to say because he's a micromanager. You know that he approved every word. And so it's really him speaking. And and, uh, and I, I think that um, he, he's crazy. He's unhinged. And he went too far. But we know what the playbook was. We know what he was trying to do, trying to get attention. And indeed, he got attention. Right. They all know. You know, in a previous show, we talked about the poll numbers that Donald Trump gets. And quite frankly, the highest he really gets is about 47, 47 and a half, maybe 48, but certainly not enough um, to push him over past 51 percent. Uh, is it a wise strategy to alienate those two to three percent, the independents, the the normal good old fashioned Reaganite GOP? with this kind of uh, fascist overtone and overtures. Uh, what's he hope to gain by, by getting, um, not getting past this 47%? Well, if, you, if, you're, if you're Trump, you have to keep on raising the pitch. You have to keep on alienating people. You have to keep on insulting them. You can't stick only with the old insults. You have to create new ones. And, and I think, you know, he lost his way here. He went too far. And he's probably going to lose some votes. Whether this costs him the election or not, I'm not sure. But I want to add a footnote to that, you guys, and it's something we should talk about. You know, this morning there was a decision by the Supreme Court about a Virginia case in which 1,600 voters, you know, were disqualified because I guess they didn't submit the right documents or something. Uh, they they were treated as non-citizens because they didn't prove they were citizens. Okay, and and the. Um, you know, the Supreme Court ruled against them, and their their votes are now disqualified. And so that's not a big number, sixteen hundred, but it shows you something really important, and we have to include it in this in the in the porridge here. The Supreme Court is a player in all of this, so we can talk about um, you know the process in the voting booth. We can talk about how people react to the insults. Uh, and the disparagements and the crazy statements he and his acolytes make. But at the end of the day, they're going to try to use some kind of trick to get it into the House of Representatives where Mike Johnson lives and flip it <clears throat> or not. And they're going to wind up in the Supreme Court. And in the Supreme Court, do I have to tell you how the Supreme Court feels about Trump? Um, the Supreme Court likes Trump. He's got a friend, at least six of them in the Supreme Court, and it, it's going to be gruesome. So we should not be misled by all this talk about the outrageous statements that he makes and whether he's going to win the popular vote or not, and how people hate him, and how people you know, in Kentucky and Missouri are going to find out about these insults. They may not. Um, you know, the, at the end of the day, there's a fair chance this is going to be determined either on the streets or in the Supreme Court. Let us not forget. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jay. Chuck, um, Jay just mentioned uh, the House of Representatives. If you listen to Trump's speeches lately, he's, he's letting on, quote unquote, the little secret that I have with Mike Johnson. Uh, you think what he's referring to at the podium, this little secret that he has an arrangement with Mike Johnson to try to get 
a close election steered over to the House of Representatives for determination of a victor? I, I don't know how he could be more obvious. That's yes with three capital letters. The strategies that have been going on now, not just the last four months, but the last four years and more, purge voter rolls, prevent voters from blacks that they suspect to be Democratic, whether it's LGBTQ or formerly incarcerated people or whoever it may be, <laughs> urban dwellers, anybody they can identify and purge from the voter rolls or preclude from voting. I mean, look at the Virginia case. They did not use voter registration records to disqualify these people. They used old driver's license applications that were clearly not currently reliable sources of information about the citizenship of those people at this time. And against the ruling of the federal district judge, against the ruling of the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, the MAGA Supremes gave Trump and Johnson and the MAGAs back that disqualification of voters for completely unreliable. These, these records would not even come in in evidence were there a civil case or a trial on this issue of their citizenship. And yet the Supreme Court has now given them credibility. Jay's comment. This is not a level playing field. There are no guardrails in our judicial systems, highest court, in our national legislatures, in our state legislatures. There are no guardrails. The question is now, what will it take to achieve a victory for Kamala Harris, not Kamala, for Christ's sake, <clears throat> Kamala Harris and Tim Walz, that will be sustainable? That's my question to you three. If you're in uh, Pennsylvania, razor tight uh, state, Nevada, also tight, Arizona tight, and you're an uh, independent that hasn't made up its mind yet as who to vote for, does it help that Donald Trump is talking about a, a little surprise with Speaker House Johnson and certainly putting on this February 20th, 1939 esque? Lindbergh-esque, Nazi-esque uh, extravaganza in Madison Square Garden. How does that, I guess I keep scratching my head each and every week. How does that get you votes from the undecided? It's the latter, not the former. It's not Johnson and the little trick strategy, right? Because culture eats strategy for lunch. But pure fear for independent voters, or otherwise independent billionaires or others, they are so afraid of what will happen to them and their people and their rights and their status if Trump wins, that they're afraid to act against it. That's the leverage of playing to his base group with an increasingly violent, increasingly vulnerable increasingly racist, misogynist, narcissistic content, not just rhetoric, but content. This is exactly as many editorial groups have articulated in the last few days. This is not a question between democracy and dictatorship anymore. It's a question between human decency and flagrant indecent, violent, divisive attacks on humanity. Well, certainly by the the lineup that he had at his uh, rally, I would agree with that statement. Uh, ben, to you. You know, uh, the so-called comedian uh, explicitly stated that there is an island of garbage floating in the ocean, and that island was Puerto Rico. Um, I was listening to a gentleman by the name of Victor Martinez. He's basically a news host uh, that specializes in in Spanish languages, Latino and, and Puerto Rican language. And he said two things that really struck me as pertinent to the discussion. And that was, 
He said, there's two things you never do or say with a Puerto Rican. One is you insult the Puerto Rican flag, and two is insult the island of Puerto Rico. But yet that was exactly done. And, and so what, what kind of shocks me is that Donald Trump said in Mar-a-Lago yesterday that um, there was love in the room, that it was breathtaking. And he, he, you know, he could have filled the room many, many times for the people that were waiting outside to come in. He said, and I quote, it was like a love fest. So rather than disown some of the, com you know, the comedians and the horrific things they said about Latinos and Puerto Ricans and uh, African Americans and you know uh, about uh, VP Harris herself, um, not one word of apology or regret. Help me, help me, Ben. Oh. Help oh. me. What's going on here? Uh, so I just want to add Jews and Palestinians too. By yes. the way, he got right. like, you know, like really, like he, 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 you know, he got the. The, the full, what is the whole, full house here, okay? For what it's worth, um, I do think that the idea is to pull more low propensity voters who like the shtick um, and, you know, like the sort of strong man image that is there. And there, I think there are a certain number of Americans who like that. And he's trying to get them to vote, right? Okay. Um, secondly, um, you know, he's playing... Um, basically a race card in, in trying, trying to basically say that America is, you know, like when Stephen Miller said Americans for Americans, you know, read white Americans. I mean, that's pretty obvious to everybody, uh, the game that, that, that has been played. Particularly if you notice, when they ever talk, talk about illegals, they always are talking about illegals from non-European illegals, okay? <laughs> if I'll say it that way, it's funny. I mean, Elon Musk was an illegal when he got here, right? And he started working. So it, but it, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. May I interrupt? Yeah. Because they really focused in on uh, Latinos and Puerto Ricans. Did they not know? Did they not realize that Puerto Ricans are United States citizens? Uh, probably not. He didn't even know that Puerto Rico was part of the United States. When, when okay, yeah, there it is right there. there. Right. There it is, gentlemen. Yeah, <laughs> right. The thing that I think that is really kind of interesting is the way he describes this as a love fest, right? To me, I could see how he could think that if it's only focused on him, him, his own ego, his thing, sort of ignoring everything about upset about anybody else, but just having what he feels like is love coming to him. I mean, it's a very, very sick vision, uh, or to me, it seems a little bit. I mean, the word is unhinged. It's very bizarre to have all that negativity and then you interpret it as love. I mean, it's, whoo, there's some deep, weird stuff in his head. But that being said, this sort of macho route that they're doing uh, is going up against essentially Kamala Harris trying to do a broad coalition. And I just noticed today, it was really interesting, Arnold Schwarzenegger. The most girly man in America has come out for Kamala Harris like an hour or two ago. So, you know, that macho thing is going to get flipped, right, in, in a weird way where they, they can't even get own the macho thing, right? So I look at him, I watch some of these, uh, um, some of his events, and I mean, I may be wrong, but it just looks like people are tired. At his events, you don't feel, and uh, I mean, you see the the rah rah. I'm, I'm never sure whether the rah rah is just because somebody's been paid, uh, but they just look tired, and um, and you know, the, I just don't think that they they have the momentum there. Um, mm -hmm. But it's it's it is it is something that is very disturbing. Yes, um, obviously, and I think uh, AOC said it right that what these are these are essentially hate meetings, right? Uh, to try to gin people up for what they're going to do after the election. Uh, one of the differences between last time and this time is that challenging voters was something that you're supposed to do before the election. Last time they didn't do that, so they lost on that point. And so now they're doing some challenges ahead of time so that now they can continue after whatever the election is. One of the things in their little secret plan that I would just say is that it all assumes that the Republicans will have a majority in the House. 
I'm not convinced they'll have a majority in the House. In which case, on January 3rd, there'll be a new um, a, a new speaker. And the new speaker might be Hakeem Jeffries. I think that there will be a number of places that will flip. I mean, I think there are 18 or 22 uh, House districts that uh, went for Biden in 2020 and then flipped uh, to uh, the Republicans in 2022. I, I firmly believe that there is red hot or maybe white hot anger in women right now at a level that you cannot ever imagine about and that there's going to be a huge number of women who are Republicans who are going to vote against Trump and vote for uh, Democrats. They may not tell anybody, but they were going to do it because there is really the, the heat, the white heat of anger across women right now, I, I sense it is really amazingly strong. And it's it's kind of a, you know, a, I, I don't know why people don't think it's it's big. I mean, I'm going to go to the Women's March on Saturday in D.C., right? And, you know, the whole reproductive health thing and women dying and all this stuff. That, and, you know, this is like for every woman in America and then for their husbands and all that, looking at the risk, like, you know, see these situations, uh, horrendous situations that people have had with their wives having miscarriages and all that. I think you're right. I think there's a, a, a great majority that are silent that haven't spoken yet. And maybe that turns up at the ballot box. Uh, I would not be surprised uh, if the Democrats <clears throat> win the House. Uh, I would not be. Uh, in fact, I, I would not be surprised if the Democrats run the table. OK, Chuck, you had your hand up for a quick second. Yeah, I wanted to inject a note of humor because there was something Ben said together with his T-shirt that just brought this visual image to my mind. And the classic macho man from the old Reagan days was the Marlboro Man, right? I want all of you and all the viewers who watch this, imagine Donald J. Trump as the Marlboro Man. Right, right. <laughs> And I see if can keep a straight face. I can't. I can't. I'm, no. I'm rolling on the floor laughing. Great. We're all feeling really, really bad for that poor horse. Right? Thank you, Chuck. All right. Jay, I don't know if you watched uh, Vice President Harris's uh, speech last night on the Ellipse at the Capitol Mall. Um, I did, and I was quite impressed. Now, some of it, to me, appeared to be a little bit of a, a repeat of the uh, convention speech. But it veered off. It, it, it took a new turn. And I'm wondering what your impressions of her making a distinction, not only about uh, government of, by way of the fascists making that distinction, but she also dipped down and drilled down hard on some economic differences, how the economy would be handled differently under a Harris administration versus a Trump administration. Your thought on that point? Oh, I loved her speech. Um, I thought it was great. Um... And I'm so glad she said everything she said. And it was OK that she repeated some things that she said at the convention and in the debate, for that matter, um, because a lot of people didn't catch it yet. Hopefully, they caught it this time. Um, so yeah, I, I think it was the best she could have done. As, compo uh, as compared to uh, Trump's uh, closing, which was you know, ridiculous, mm. ridiculous, ridiculous. I mean, how anybody could accept or believe or support what he was saying is beyond me. However, you know, the question is whether the battleground states, the people in the battleground states are going to get it, whether the, the, that news reaches them, whether they integrate that news against their, what do you call it, you know, MAGA bubble um, or not. And I am not convinced that all of these things that are happening this week you know, with the, the Puerto Ricans and, and the closing speeches and the like, and some news that's coming out in favor of Kamala. But, you know, it's it's amazing to me how screwed up the newspapers are. I'll give you a, a, just a small example. Ben was talking about how, you know, the women are white hot about the abortion issue. Well, there was an article, I think, in this morning's paper, whether the Times and the Post, I don't remember. They both sort of do the same thing in many ways. Um, to the effect that there's a lot of women out there uh, who are Trumpers, but they, mm, you know, believe uh, in freedom to choose. However, they're still going to vote for Trump. And and I say, what? 
You know, and that's because Trump has confused them about his real agenda. And so, you know, confusion is all over the country. Confusion is in the battleground states. Confusion is in the, the red states. It's very hard to wean people away and clarify things like that for them three or four days. Actually, Friday is the last real day of campaign because yeah. Monday doesn't count. The weekend doesn't count. It's Friday. We're talking about a couple of days. That's all. You know, but I, I am pessimistic on whether what we are talking about, and to some extent, not enough in my opinion, uh, whether the national newspapers, what the national newspapers are talking about, whether that is reaching the people who might change their votes. Do you think the media uh, caught well enough this October surprise, and the October surprise being Donald Trump's surprise to Donald Trump and his campaign? Do you think the media has done a fair job in the last two days on highlighting this uh, 1939-esque rally at Madison Square Garden? To the four of us, yes. But there's a lot of, but, but it's a little mixed though. It's a little mixed. I mean, there was one, right. uh, there was one article about how, yes, he, he drew a lot of people and yes, they were very excited. And that's really not the point. Um, right. So I'm, I'm not sure that it was a perfect score. I wouldn't give them a perfect score, but I would, I would be very concerned as I mentioned um, that that it's not reaching people. It's not reaching the voters. And they remain, what do you want to say, uninformed? That's a euphemism, uninformed. Right. And they're not going to change their votes, even though these, these things have been remarkable and 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 unhinged. Yeah. Is that a result of our, our um, division or our silos of media intake, where we get our media from, be it social media well, or from uh, Fox versus... Uh, CNN and MSNBC. Well, if I could jump in on that, sure, go ahead. Um, I, you know, one thing that, and it just seems to me as I've watched over the last four years, with the changing of who are heading up organizations, CNN or uh, certainly the Washington Post, too, last October twenty third, there's been an, a sort of a more rightification of the management in these entities than maybe were there at 2020. So I've noticed that in the tone of the kind of coverage that they have, they've tended to be, at least in my period, I've been a little more, even though they're supposed to be quote unquote down the middle, they're a little more empathetic, if I could say it, to the extreme right stuff. Now the most direct image of course is what happened with the LA Times and with the Washington Post this last week, right? Uh, in terms of the uh, non-endorsement. Um, but, you know, the, I think that this whole sort of, what is it called, anticipatory of obedience thing and wanting to make sure that they have access if he wins, it's kind of kind of shifted this way that these he, the coverage is on him. I also think that one of the problems all these people who are trying to do this ha may have is if Kamala Harris wins. And wins big, they're all going to have egg on their face about how they were sucking up to Trump, and that will be fascinating to watch how they try to do the flip at that point, having, having compromised themselves so much in, in fear. You know, it's going to be fascinating to watch. I think that's absolutely right. But I also want to add that in the morning paper there was another article that that feeds into this somehow. So Trump. Um, faced with um, these two um, reversals uh, on the L.A. Times and Washington Post, responded. And you know what he said? He said the non-endorsements on right. both of those papers were really an endorsement of him. Yeah. yeah. Now, that's, I'm not, I'm, that's crazy. I would never have printed that. Never. Right. But, well, but let me, let me add... There, there are there are people in the country that accept that and believe that. Sure. And he completely neutralizes the truth by a lie. He's desperate right now. Sometimes desperation works. I mean, that's the stint. We don't know. Chuck, to you. You know, we have um, Nevada, Arizona, North Carolina, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin. We have seven swing dates, swing states that are by and large razor thin. Uh, to to Ben's point. Does the silent majority of women make a difference in those swing states? And uh, did Kamala Harris, was she successful in, in making a distinction about what the future holds for Americans, 
be go with Trump or with her. What Jay and Ben have said, and what Kamala Harris said in her so-called closing remark speech, <clears throat> that is the question here. Are people going to accede and acquiesce to fear, division, and chaos to a concept of America in which your enemy is your cohabitant? Your enemy is your co-resident. The enemy is the people you live with. Is that's the vision that people are willing to accept and empower Trump to exercise pure dictatorial, autocratic, no guardrail power in? Are, are you defining a cold civil war? Absolutely. It's a cultural civil war. It's a cultural war. But it is a cultural war exactly as Jay and Ben have identified. Those within the dominant culture from Trump's perspective are white, evangelical, mostly older, mostly men, but there are also a good deal of women in there, in the white evangelical category. And he's hoping that in the undecided, the independent, the whatever you want to call them group, that the fear of those people under his command will be great enough to intimidate those people into either not voting or voting for him. That's his strategy. Mm -hmm. He's a one-trick pony. Right. So, and he's you know, not the Marlboro man on the pony. So okay. I just want to remember, remember everybody, there's FDR, right? The only thing to fear is fear itself, right? I mean, this is like an old game, right? Just remember well, there's, that. There's a lot of Americans not getting a lot of sleep right now because of just that, fear. Yeah, and, yeah. And well, I, I, I may be one of them. <laughs> I'm not sleeping yeah. so well. <laughs> it's not just fear. The flip side of fear is hate. Yeah. And, and, the country, and the country has plenty of that. It's always had plenty of that. Sure. But you know what? What what strikes me, Ben? This is something of what you said about Trump's appreciation of Puerto Rico—that it is part of the United States, that they're American citizens and the like. Ben, he knows. He grew up in New York. He grew up, and I grew up in New York. And I'll tell you, at that time, you know, this is like the time of West Side Story, right? Yeah. It tells us tells us a lot about what was going on with the Puerto Ricans. Sure. And how they were fighting the others, and you know yeah. they were the victims of a lot of a lot of hate and crime, yeah, victims. And so Trump is playing on that. He's trying to exacerbate the hate that is deep in the soul of, of, of people, people in New York too, elsewhere. Yeah. You know, yeah. Puerto Ricans, they're just they're just like those migrants coming across the border. They're Latin American. they're, they're not from Norway. He's trying to associate that with American citizens. But a lot of people don't make the distinction. They're Puerto nope. Ricans. And from way back one, a lot of people don't like Puerto Ricans. And I think that's 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 his playbook, too. He's trying to exacerbate hate. So it's hate on the one side and fear on the other. It's both. And that was in Mein Kampf. That was. Right. Right. All righty. Um, last question uh, to you, Ben, and we have to wrap up here. Um, there's a lot of comments right now saying, you know, Liz Cheney did it. Uh, Dick Cheney did it. They came out and they endorsed uh, Vice President Harris to stop a, a would-be dictator from a another four-year term. Uh, should uh, Romney and George Bush Jr. do the same? Yeah, the, I mean, there's this whole problem of the men versus the women, I say, in the Republican Party, although there have been some men on the Republican side who've come out and actually endorsed Kamala Harris recently. And most, you're seeing uh, Republican men basically saying they're not going to vote for Trump, but they're not actually going all the way to endorse Kamala Harris. And the logic is, why? They don't want to be primary, right? They don't want to be primary when they're up for election. And the They're out of office. Uh, well, the ones are out of office, fair enough, mm -hmm. uh, but they also want to have, quote unquote, influence or something or want to be above the fray, which is right. a, another dangerous thing. You know, the fray is always there. Right. You know, and what's nice is I think uh, George Bush's daughter has come out for Kamala Harris. So that, you know, that's the kind of subtle thing that you see once in a while. 
uh, that is a way of being in there but not being in there. The other thing that I think is interesting is uh, Nikki Haley just came out. It's kind of doing her wishy-washy thing again, okay? But uh, it's interesting how she is really pushing back on the way that they're losing with women. I think that that is fascinating to see her really jump on that. Even Megyn Kelly is doing it too, you know, the brotastic thing. There is, you know, evidence that there is a serious recognition that they are blowing serious parts of their agenda. But uh, getting the guys to actually stand up, you know, they're, they're worried about being primary, every one of them. Yeah, who's in office or aspires to be off in office now? Party before country. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ben. Uh, Chuck, your last thoughts on this topic and uh, this rally or whatever you want to talk about. This is our last show, by the way, before the election. I think Ben and Jay hit it on the head. I think the ultimate outcome will depend on the women. They have more colonies and more chromosomes and more brains than we do. <laughs> All right. We're counting on those C's. Character, conscience, and courage are the other three C's we're counting on. It's the women we look to. I'm not counting on the men to be able to come up with enough of what really makes a mensch to make this result what it should be. Thank you, Chuck. Lovely. Ben, your last thoughts. I think as people sit down and think about it, um, as I saw with regards to a barber in a barber shop, there were the people who were wondering, you know, is this the kind of job, quote unquote, a woman can have, right? And he was asked, well, what does he think? And he said, well, I'm not going to say anything because I'm married. <laughs> That's perfect, right? You know, okay, you know. And then he saw, he's talking about it, he's thinking about it, and he said, well, you know, actually, my wife runs my house, right? You know, so it's kind of like, if she can, you know, woman can run my house, she can run the country, you know, probably do a better job than me. You know what I mean? That was this kind of revelation moment in his head. And I thought that was pretty in insightful after a point of, you know, why not? Yeah, probably do a better job than any of us. All right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ben. Jay, you get the final word here. This eight year campaign um, has changed the country, or maybe it reflects changes in the country and and then you get an echo, and that means even greater changes. And what we have now is an election that is unprecedented really anywhere, anytime in our history and in global history. And it, it will be the election by which the American experiment is judged going forward. If Trump gets elected, it's really awful for the country. It will affect every single person in the country, including those people who have not taken the time to inform themselves and vote for him. I'm very concerned about this. I am not sure what's going to happen. I like to think, Chuck, about your scenario of the voter going into the privacy, the sanctity of the voting booth and having uh, you know, a, a, a change of heart. But I'm not sure that, that that he's been reached or she's been reached. I'm not sure that uh, they feel all that good about Arnold Schwarzenegger. After all, he's not American, is he? <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> so if you if you evoke hate, if you evoke isolationism, um, you don't know where it ends. And that's why it's so hard to understand what's going on and, and to make an, an effective prediction, because we don't know where Trump's craziness ends. And he may have reached more people than we thought. I would like to think he reached less. But I'll tell you next week, okay? We're going to have a show right after the election. Uh, yeah. This is the last show before election. Uh, I'd like to make a couple points, and that is um, behind me is a, uh, it's a print uh, that my friend, uh, a lot, lifetime friend that uh, created, uh, he just died last month. And it's a, it's a print of Mussolini in his uh, regalia, his military garb. And in the bottom corner on his lapel, he's wearing a Trump 2020 campaign badge. Uh, I got this from Jim about four years ago, uh, before the 2020 election. It's appropriate to post it right now. It says 2020, but it should say 2024. And what it is is to say that all dictators, I think, living or, or dead, I think they want Donald Trump to be the next president again, uh, be it Putin, Xi, uh, you know, uh, Orban from Hungary, um, 
Kim Jong-un, all of them. I think they're secretly hoping that Donald Trump will be their guy in the most powerful country in the, in, in the world, that Donald Trump would be in the catbird seat to help them and aid them in their, their agenda. And last but not least, um, I would always say at a, an event like this that people should go out and vote, do your civic duty. I, I'm going to add to that. And I don't like to do it, but I'm going to do it for this show. Yes, please get out of your chair, vote. Vote for Harris and Waltz. Your country depends on it. And with that, I'm Tim Apicell, the host of American Issues Take One. Join us next week after the election. And until then, vote and aloha. Mm-hmm.